Hey everybody, this is Andrew and John as always. This is Sasquatchers. Tonight we have an awesome guest lined up that we're going to introduce to you after the intro. The truth is out there. Never stop looking. Never be sheep. Always disrupt. We are the ungovernable. We are the truth seekers. We are Sasquatchers. By a guest that I am honored to introduce. His name is Thomas Seawid. And he is a member of the, let's see if I say it right, Kwakwaki Walk tribe and a expert on Sasquatch coming from, you're in Vancouver tonight? No, uh, Gelakasla, greetings in my language. I'm actually in Kent, Washington, just south of Seattle. My wife lived down here and then COVID came and I moved here full time, but I'm always up in Vancouver Island every month. Awesome. Okay. So you're uh, relaxing, getting ready to uh, do anything like squatching wise coming up? Oh, yeah. In the 21st of September, uh, December, because I, bah humbug, I hate Christmas. I used to go watch <laughs> logging camps during the December, January season up in British Columbia throughout the 90s and early 2000s and sports fishing camps. I go watch them just to get away from Christmas. And if I wasn't doing that, I was commercial fishing offshore. So this year we're going to go to Forks, Washington, where SasquatchLegend.com has their Sasquatch store. And uh, I did the murals outside. They have a house one block away from the store. And the Olympic Peninsula, a Sasquatch hotbed. So instead of wasting my time wrapping presents and shopping, me and my wife, when we're not in the store during the daytime, we're going to be out investigating with parabolic dishes, flurs, telephoto lens, camera, you name it. We got the equipment. We're going to be boots to the ground while everyone's eating turkey and burping away afterwards. We're going to be out there on all the rivers looking for Sasquatch and see what we can come across. I think that sounds a lot more fun than a, a, most of my Christmas traditions tend to be. I would. I mean, you I could take, you you could take the turkey out with you. You can have, yeah, can have both, be both worlds. <laughs> yeah. As, if you look at the Olympic Peninsula, being a peninsula, you got salt water on, you know, three sides of it, basically. And you got the Ho Indian tribe, the Makah Indian tribe, the Quinaults down south on the west coast. The Quinault uh, Indian Reservation is pretty huge. And there's all kinds of Sasquatch reports. Even that famous Fleur image of a Sasquatch crouching down. And you can see the cows lying down sleeping in the forested pasture. That comes from Quinault Indian Reserve. And then the Olympic Peninsula on the uh, up by Port Angeles on the north side, you have the Olympic Project, Derek Randalls, Shane Corson, and their team members. And they've been getting all kinds of success finding nest structures of Sasquatches, clicker rocks. Uh, they found tracks and other things. And they've even had some sightings by the sounds of it. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, we have never experienced anything like that at least not that we've discussed ever <laughs> i don't know if you're hiding anything from me john but um... uh, i'm hiding a lot of things but it's not that <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that like when i started this show like, in my head i was like you know what man at some point i gotta get out there you know it's i'm not that old but i'm not that young anymore and you know, I just want to get out there and start kind of solving some of these mysteries and seeing some of this stuff for myself. And it's a driving force for this show. So uh, I am tremendously jealous of the experiences that you just live on on the daily. It seems um, not so much daily anymore. I do. Uh, you can see the design here. Where is it? Right there, of that green Sasquatch background, and then the footprints and the designs up over here. You know, everything's my creations. And, you know, I was a commercial fisherman for 48 years and thro extensively throughout the British Columbia coast. And that's where I really learned a lot about Sasquatch because I was 
Tommy 10,000 questions as a kid. And we'd end up in these docks in Indian villages and tied up at logging camps and, you know, meeting with other commercial fishermen. And I always ask, what do you know about Sasquatch? Because when I watched the TV show or movie, uh, Unsolved Mysteries with Leonard Nimoy narrating when I was like 11 years old, it just enthralled me seeing the video of Patty. And then I went to my father and I said, you know, hey, dad, I said, I saw that movie and it had the big, Bigfoot, a Sasquatch covered in hair. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's Chonacha. That's what we call it. You know, when we go to the potlatches and you see the Chonacha walk onto the floor and fur regalia and a big carved mask with puckered lips and sleepy eyes. And when it goes out on the floor, it yawns. And then all of a sudden it's whooping like it's calling. And then you see it going like that throwing the bad children into the basket. So I'll show the people there that one drawing I did there. That's a big chonach with chasing a young girl and it's stuffing a bat misbehaving boy into the basket. And that's our native legend of the Kwakwak Ewok people. Our boogeyman, so to speak, is a female Sasquatch who'll grab you with a big hairy arm when you're sleeping because you misbehave. Put spruce sap from the spruce tree like syrup in your eyes so you're blind and can't see. And then she's going to throw you in that basket or like that other design right there, shove you into a sack, like a potato sack, and throw him the sack on his back or the basket. And it runs into the forest up a mountain far, far away to its invisible home. That's why we can't find Sasquatches. And that's where Chonacha, the Sasquatch, takes those children from her basket or her sack and she boils them up and eats them. So I was brought up with that. You know, so that's, a, that's why I'm so intrigued by Sasquatch. <clears throat> that new question. nightmare unlocked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I used to see my kids when I used to tell them that when they're out in the bush. Boy, they'd be right beside me, wouldn't leave me, and they'd be well behaved. But I don't know if my kids could even handle that. If I'm being completely <laughs> honest, I would have to really like PG that down a little bit. Uh, for them to, I, they would just be traumatic. I, I, they'd be in my bed for the next six months, probably, if I told them that. Is, um, there, a, is there a Disney version of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what my group's all about it's on Facebook, Sasquatch Island. Like you were saying, you want to get some answers to your questions, hopefully, have a close encounter of the hairy kind with Sasquatch. And that's why I became, I guess you could say, an investigator in about 2014. Prior to that, I was just uh, living out in the bush, doing tourism. I was a bear hunting guide, specializing in grizzly bear hunts as a trophy hunting guide for over 20 years. And I watched logging camps. I did all kinds of stuff for, for decades out in the bush. That was my home. I hated the cities, and I still do. I preferred being out there in the bush world. I wasn't so damn old. My right leg wasn't so buggered up from arthritis and everything else and married to Peggy. I'd still be out there. But what I did was I'd watch TV in 2014 when I moved down here part-time and Peggy introduced me to the remote control because they're very complicated. I wasn't used to them at that time. <laughs> and she showed me how to use it and showed me all these streaming TV shows and all these Sasquatch Bigfoot shows are on there. So I started watching them when she was working. She'd come home from work and she'd hear me arguing with the TV. Ah, Nishna Nutlu Mama. Oh, those crazy white people. Oh, they're stupid. The hell are they doing banging on trees with bats? They even got special tree knockers, they call them. That's just ridiculous. They're trying to find a Sasquatch, yet they're banging a tree. All they're doing is imitating what the Sasquatch does when it bangs a tree. Bang, bang, bang. Stop, turn around, go back where you came from, human. I don't want you here. So when you tree knock, you're telling the Sasquatch to stop, turn around, go away from me. I don't want you here. So you, that's why the non-Indians never see Sasquatches when they're tree knocking. They're telling the Sasquatches to bugger off. It's like putting the middle finger up when you tree knock to a Sasquatch. So other things I would talk to Peggy about, and you know, she would go like, you really knowledgeable about these Sasquatch. And I said, well, they're out there. I said, I used to hear them. I used to go to bed at night, plug in my ears. La, 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 la. I don't hear that. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. When they're whooping and roaring and making noise. And so to me, Sasquatches are just like white animals. You spend enough time in the bush, you will see them, hear them, and smell them. They're out there. 
And so, so, I, so Peggy said, well, why don't you go share your knowledge, you know? And I said, well, how, how do I do that? And she goes, well, why don't you go on a podcast? I'm like, what's a podcast? So she introduced me to what a podcast was. So I went to Google the next day, up come Sasquatch Chronicles, Wes Germer. So I send an email. He phones me that afternoon. We talk for like not even 10 minutes. And he goes, hey, Tom, how about I just record it? And I said, sure. So we did an episode. A few days later, he fooled me and he said, you know, everyone wants to hear more about what you know. So we did like four or five episodes and I'm still getting people reaching out going, I heard you through Wes Germer. I heard you through this podcast. You're very knowledgeable. And that's when after Wes Germer, that's when I stuck took over the Facebook group, Sasquatch Island. And people always ask me, you know, like, here's our t-shirt design here. You know, where's Sasquatch Island? I'm like, you're standing on North America. You know, the Indians, all 600 plus tribes in North America referred to North America as Turtle Island before contact. And even to this day, because North America looks like a turtle from space. Hudson's Bay, the mouth up in Canada, Aleutian Islands, a flipper. Labrador, Newfoundland, East Coast, Canada, Flipper, Florida, Baja, California, the peninsula, Flippers, Mexico, and Central America, the tail. How they got found that out before contact, I don't know. I study UFOs, not or Sasquatch, not UFOs. So Sasquatch Island, I took it over because I had a button that said, this group needs an administrator. I didn't even know what an administrator was, so I clicked it. And next thing you know, I took over a group. I think it had 54 members. We have over 14,000 in building right now. And Sasquatch Island Facebook group, everyone goes, Tom, well, now that I know that North America is Sasquatch Island, you're so knowledgeable. Why don't you write a book? I'm like, I have. It's called The Post that I put on Sasquatch Island. Very rarely will I allow someone to post something on Sasquatch Island. It's all the go-to Facebook group so that you can go there, go to the bathroom, grab a beverage, sit down, start scrolling away and go right back to the beginning. And I guarantee you, after you've read every post and listened to every video on Sasquatch Island, you will be a really good investigator of Sasquatch. You will know the tricks that I know to play bush chess so that the Sasquatch and you are using the wind to your advantage to try to outbox the Sasquatch so that you can do like I've done and all of a sudden look look from behind something and there's the back shoulder of a sasquatch looking for you and yet he's got his back to you that's bush chess and you got to remember sasquatch has forgotten more about the bush and stealth and breaking silhouette and camouflaging themselves than we'll ever know but because i lived out in the bush for decades and at one point in the early 1990s i had a letter from IRS Canada said I owed over seventy thousand dollars because of a corrupt uh, what do you call um accountant back in the day when I was commercial fishing big time with big money. A uh, girlfriend did something that with my best friend that you know I just like I don't want to be here no more. This this world with roads and electricity is just I'm a round peg, a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. I don't fit. So I went where I was comfortable, being a commercial fisherman, hunter, Indian food harvester, going out to the bush islands of my traditional territories. That's what I did. And I went to bush and I built an empire of eco-cultural tourism. I uh, would watch logging camps, like I said, and I would harvest red cedar trees for shake and shingle roofing products out in the bush and use helicopters to fly them out of the bush down to these big massive barges that would be towed to the city sell our wood and we'd make our money so the bush to me was my world and of course out there every now and then you look over and yo hello i don't know who you are sasquatch what are you up to and you'd hear and they just move away because the one thing about sasquatch is you respect them and they will respect you this picture right here of that tree peak in Sasquatch. If you look close at it, the pupils have a reflection of my wife with a ponytail and a backpack and a walking stick. And the Sasquatch is looking at her. And what a Sasquatch will do is grab a branch and look at you. And if you're doing your thing, maybe you're a prospector, a mushroom picker, a hiker, a forester, a logger, you're out in the bush, you're comfortable uh, hunting. 
and the Sasquatch watches you and realizes that you're a bush dancer. You flow like the breeze in the forest. You're not looking down where every footfall goes because you're not from the city environment and wearing REI and mountain equipment co-op, bright colors, bear bells, pack sack with a water bottle with a hose going to your mouth and some corporate hat on advertising some clothing manufacturer for when you go to the bush, you know, and the Sasquatch sees you're comfortable. So it pulls the branch even further, lets it go. And as it bounces like that, it turns and it walks away. And when the human turns and sees that bouncing branch, there's no bird, there's no raccoon, there's no cougar cub, there's no bobcat, there's no bear cub, there's no squirrel. What that bouncing branch is telling you is the Sasquatch said, I'm here too. I saw you. I'm leaving you to do about your thing. I'm going to expect the same from you. Don't follow me. Don't chase me. And dare not ever think of going to hunt or harvest or kill a Sasquatch. That is so wrong. In every Indian tribe throughout North America, not one of those tribes condone the killing of Sasquatch. So don't ever do that. Always respect them. Yeah. Um, that's a weird kind of ideology that I'm not sure where that comes from. But I, you were, you talked about shows earlier and I just found one and I, I don't, I think it might be canceled. I only found it that it had like nine episodes. It's called the real Bigfoot. And the entire concept of this show was they were going out and they were shooting to kill and they were going to put a body on the table. And they said it was dedicated to science, but you know, of all of this sensationalism that you see on television in, in the paranormal genre or the cryptid genre or Sasquatch genre, because it certainly has become a genre on television, that was the craziest thing that I have ever seen. Like, my mouth hit the floor when I saw that. And uh, that was a question that I kind of decided I was always going to bring up. And, you know, when I have these Sasquatch experts on kind of, get the opinion so the fact that you even you got to it before i was even able to ask was uh was uh interesting and i i appreciate that knowledge that all of the tribes can then pass on to everybody else because that was crazy to me to see them it's like nine episodes of a tv show and they have dedicated snipers and i didn't obviously that the show came and went and there's never a body on the table either so i mean take it for the grain of salt that it was yeah and i think the networks are dummying up as well you know like i think they're just getting a lot of negative communication coming to them whether it be emails or regular snail mail letters but the public opinion is no kill and you know in this day and age when we're protecting everything and then me i'm not pro-environmentalist you know personally i actually think environmentalists are the worst invasive species to us indians in north america you know because they shut down so many industries and uh careers for our people and you know ways to generate revenue fish farming logging mining you know grizzly bear hunting i used to make sixty thousand dollars plus a year being a grizzly bear hunting guide but the environmentalists in british columbia forced the government to shut it down without any science base and now we have grizzly bears ex populations exploding like bunny rabbits, people getting attacked by them, you know, houses and things, problematic grizzlies, the government's got to go in and shoot them. And, you know, there's no revenue generation for people to be hunting guides for grizzly bears anymore. And they keep saying, oh, there's more money in bear view. And I said, but you got to have that balance. And, you know, and so, you know, we got to watch what we're doing. And with Sasquatches, you know, to me, I personally think that it's murder because I've seen them up close. You know, I've been six feet away from them. I've seen them walk, you know, through the beach and on the, out in the forest. And, you know, to me, they're got the same nose as us. They just have a more pronounced filter on the distance between the top of your lip and the bottom of your nose. Their jaw is a little bit more pronounced like Patty. They got a little bit of brow ridge, you know, basically Patty. That's what a Sasquatch looks like, male and female. Males are just a little bit more tougher looking. And, you know, that's why I always tease people. And, you know, and actually it's kind of unfortunate that uh, Sasquatches are sort of perceived like Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ was born in a major in the Middle East 
how come he looks so Caucasian? He looks like he came out of Finland, you know, when you see pictures of Jesus <laughs> right. Christ. He's white, you know, he's got that nice beard and the long hair, and he looks like uh, he just came out of Woodstock as a hippie. But, you know, in truth, Jesus Christ being born where he was and with, you know, his mother being from there as well, he should be a little bit darker, have the features from that area of the world. But then we look at Sasquatch, and every time we see Sasquatches, it looks like your partner there. It looks like you just jumped off a of Harley Davidson with that big biker beard. I you was going to ask about that. You know, Sasquatch is in the Pacific Northwest and on the Omaha Indian Reserve because I seen a big male there with its pregnant female uh, under 100 yards with a Fleur Mono Scout, the Mono Fleur unit. And we've had a good two minute sighting with that two Sasquatches. And that's right away I looked and I noticed that the face was like me trying to go a beard. It wouldn't even be like yours. It would be all, actually, I got pictures of it. It's pathetic. Because I'm a thoroughbred Indian, I have very little body hair under my arms. I got nothing on my chest. That's the way Indians are. And that's what a Sasquatch is. They look just like that, except their entire body's hairy, but their face has got that Indian feature, really broken up, stubbly, just like Patty. So, you know, that's why I tell people, you know, like some, especially some of the chainsaw carvers that I talk with is, you know, I'm educating people that Sasquatches don't look like they jumped off a of Harley Davidson. So you might want to not go down that Jesus path and start perceiving that they got these big biker beards because people that like me that know what a Sasquatch looks like when I go buy Sasquatch art and I've bought a, quite a bit from other artists if they have a biker beard I just walk away you know it doesn't look like a Sasquatch so yeah, a lot of, you know the artist has got to be careful of that a lot of those carvings and stuff really adopted that and I had saw your post on on the uh, Sasquatch Island face group about that and I wanted to I wanted to ask you about that because I'm not sure when that when that happened because it kind of went from and here's the like even that the allegory you just made to, to Jesus is it seems to me over I don't maybe the last just couple of years uh, Sasquatch in a way has kind of become the new Jesus fish so to speak like you went like everywhere in the 90s and there was a Jesus fish on a car and now every other car i see you got you know something sasquatch related or a silhouette sticker or something to that effect so you know the art for sasquatch is everywhere at this point it's really overpopulated at least over here in, in my area where it didn't that didn't exist before so i don't know if you know the our coast is finally catching on to the west side of of sasquatch culture or something and for me it's all about Patty. And I had a surprise birthday party the other day. My wife threw it for me. And I couldn't even get through a surprise birthday party without arguing with my cousin about the Patterson Gimlin film. And, you know, I got, you know, I got my cousin sitting there who drove an hour and a half to come hang out with me. And he just talks about how, like, nah, man, that's not real. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nope, we're going to fight now. Because to me, and I was going to, I bring it up to you. I think like the Patterson Gimlin film is to this day, such an incredible piece of evidence that we have. Um, I, you referenced it. So I like, I assume like, do you um, adhere to that video that it's real or do you, do you think it's a clever, like a good hoax? I think it's the real deal. Number one, you got to look at it from my perspective. I lived like a Sasquatch for decades. So looking at it from a Sasquatch's perspective, Patty's in a creek. She's doing something, drinking, eating, maybe washing a wound. And the creek's burbling and making its noise so she can't hear. The windage, the horse spooked. So it means the Sasquatch was upwind. The horse smelled Patty. And that's why it did its thing. and. Patterson and or Gimlin, whoever was with the camera, it's all jiggly. Uh, Patterson, and then the Sasquatch looks up, boom, 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 looks over her shoulder for famous three fifty two frame, turns and goes straight for the bush line. So right there, the evidence to me, if you're gonna hoax it, that's not a hoax. That they spooked the Sasquatch, and then when you're like me who's seen Sasquatches, that's the real deal. Remember this sparse hair. Pronounced Feltrum, blocky jaw, 
at a uh, little bit of brow ridge, the longer arms, the way it's walking and loping and going like that. And then, you know, then it can be contested about that guy that when he was alive came out and said, I was the guy in the, in the costume. Here's my gate and so forth. You know, he probably got burned by Roger Patterson and felt that he needed to make some money and be on the stage and get some spotlight time. So he looks at the Patty frame, duplicates the walk, comes out with his BS story. You know, and that's what you got to really watch for is I always tell people to, when you're Sasquatch investigate, investigate the people, especially on your encounters. So when you look at, you know, I can't, I won't say his name for defamation of character and so forth, but the guy out of Alberta that had the Muppets he's famous for and the black face one and come on. Every time I hear that guy with my leg hurts, he's pulling it so much, you know, that's just bunk and BS. And, you know, you look, got to look at the individual that claims they have the perfect video and audio and things like that, you know, bunk and BS, you know, someone's got a video or, and uh, it's a Sasquatch in the snow. If there's no track follow up that, even though I know it's scary when you see a Sasquatch. So no, I don't expect someone to go down the road for an hour and come back where they just saw a Sasquatch and walk into the, where they saw it to look for tracks. It's scary. Maybe wait till the next day and then go back with some buddies and, you know, protection and take pictures of the tracks because they will be there in the snow. Case in point, the guy from Alberta and his TV show and you watch it and he's, I'm here and there's almost two feet of snow. I can hear them. There's Sasquatches about. Oh, look, there's a Sasquatch looking at me. Yeah. Lights a hand flare. (laughs) Get away from me. And the next scene is daylight and there's him talking about Sasquatches. Well, if you've seen that Sasquatch and you got so scared at the light of flare and wave it around, how come you didn't go and first thing at daylight and get us pictures of the trackway? You know, see what I mean? Investigate the human, bunk and BS. So I always look at that. I look at, you know, when you do see a Sasquatch, they generally, in my area, Pacific Northwest, I can't speak for other regions, they generally look like the misconception of Jesus Christ. Nice, long hair really looks oily and shiny. The body, the hair looks like a chimpanzee, an orangutan, a great gorilla, a monkey. It's got all that oil in there. Just like when we go hiking or hunting or camping for a week or more without a shower. You know, look how oily our hair gets. Well, back when I used to have hair, you know, it gets that monkey sheen, I call it. And, you know, even can go like that with your fingers and you can see the oil. So that's what a Sasquatch looks like. So when you see the... You know, even though rest his soul, you know, he came out, Mr. Freeman, with a supposed pretty good video of a Sasquatch. I'm not sold on that one. It looks too synthetic, the hair. It looks too spiky. It looks polyester to me. doesn't have that oily, well-kept sheen. So, you know, but then I look at the Independence Day video of the Sasquatch peeking from the boulders in that pine forest. And it dips down and it runs from boulder to boulder, dips down, comes up and it's holding a baby and looks at the person video and then runs away. And you can see that oily sheen. But one of the things that you can even see the sheen on her face. But one of the things that's interesting is you see that flap of fat over the top end of her buttocks. You know, and I've heard that when I've asked people and when someone's given me reports 20 plus years ago. Oh, yeah, I saw a female that was picked up its baby and it was running down from the shellfish beach up into the forest. And I was only about maybe 60 yards from it. I said, well, what do you... What did you notice about it? That person said, I noticed that above that mama Sasquatch, above her butt, she had like a beer belly flap over top. And right away when I saw Independence Day, I thought, son of a gun, I got to keep asking about this because most humans don't even know that what we used to call bush people in South Africa, now known as, uh, or pygmies, but we refer to them as bush people now, and bush man and bush woman, gods must be crazy. I read decades ago when I was in private school, a scientific journal about someone who was studying the pygmies of that time, as they called them, derogatory name now. But they, they found that the females had a flap of skin, flesh, over top of their genitalia not known in any other human form that flap of skin but it's found in those bush people and yet 
North American female Sasquatches in some reports have that flap of skin over the top end of the buttock when they have babies. What that is, we don't know. But then again, if you look at humans, you know, you look at us three, you know, can you imagine 600 years ago, the three of us all of a sudden jumped through a porthole and all sat down together looking at each other? I'd be looking at your buddy going, what the hell is that? White skin, bald head, big biker beard. I'd look at you and kind of Indians he, I don't recognize his bloodlines. So what it was like 600 years ago and beyond for most humans, especially in North America, because it wasn't discovered technically, you know, can you imagine an Indian seeing a Scandinavian or an Aborigine or uh, someone from Kenya come through a portal and be in North America 600 years ago? It's intriguing. It's shocking. Well, Sasquatch to me, and that's why I call them just humans of the night, the, the perfect human, because when we look at humans, I mentioned about the bush people being a little different. Well, people in the Andes and the Himalayas have a larger lung capacity than the rest of the humans of the world because they live over 10,000 feet. The Inuit up in the above the Arctic Circle in the, on this planet, whether it be Greenland, Russia, Alaska, Canada, they all have a larger liver than any other human on the planet because they're dealing with all the oil from the whales and the walrus and the seals that they eat. So here we are with evolution. The humans have changed and we just take it for granted that we are different colored skin, different texture, hair, different colored hair. Some have freckles, some don't. Some look like they come from Asia, around Japan and China. And others look like they come from the Aborigines of Africa, the people from Africa that can't come from there, Scandinavians and so forth, and you know, Mediterranean. We've evolved because of our regions and where we live and how we live. And that's why Sasquatch to me is a human, because I think that thousands of years ago, because we all accept that our relic human ancestors jumped out of a tree, were quadruped, would drag their knuckles and eventually become bipedal. They would lose their body hair. They would lose their brow ridges, their pronounced philtrum, their pronounced jaw, their face would suck in. National Geographic educated us to believe this all of our lives. And we all take for granted that our distant ancestor came from Africa, maybe Lucy or whoever else, Neanderthal and so forth. But I think that thousands of years ago during that evolutionary path and the branches were building and going off, I think the Sasquatches, I think they sat there and looked at their fellow clan with hairy bodies and looking like a Sasquatch and saying, look, you know, they're using rocks and bones and making tools and weapons. They're using rocks and sticks and making fire. And because they have fire, they're getting wimpy and now they got to have clothing because they have the tools to make the clothing and hides and sew them together. And then now they're expanding our religion, our governance, our social structure. We have materialism. What I just explained right there is an evolutionary path that we saw take place in an hour and 45 minutes and the gods must be crazy. How a Bush family can have an empty Coke bottle thrown out of an airplane and land in their community. And all of a sudden, it disrupts everything, turns the family unit, the society upside down where the father chief has to go, I have to bring this empty Coke bottle to the end of the world and throw it back to the gods because it must be crazy to disrupt us with that bottle. So Gods Must Be Crazy is a show that every Sasquatch investigator must watch, the first one from the 80s, because it really explains to us why the Sasquatches have laws, very strict laws. They don't, in most cases, use the knives that are left out in our backyards and our cleaning tables. As I'm an Indian, we have cleaning tables in our backyards for fish and animals and so forth. They don't take our knives. Our axes, whether they're Indian or not, that's sitting in a big round of wood where we split our firewood isn't stolen by Sasquatches. Why is that? Well, they have laws, very strict laws. They're not allowed to touch our stuff. They don't have fire. And then we look at us as a people. And right now we sit, you know, a lot of us are concerned that, you know, Putin and Biden and Rocket Man in North Korea, the Israelis, the British, the French, the Pakistanis, the East Indians, you know, these are, we as a species are the dumbest critter on this planet. And yet 
all the countries I named, their leaders are sitting there with fingers over buttons, ready to launch nuclear missiles if need be and eradicate us. That's what clicking rocks that sparked and ribbon bow drills and using the bow and bow from a bow and arrow to make fire quicker. That's what our evolutionary path has brought us to. Whereas Sasquatch, when you think about it and you investigate Sasquatch reports as I do, you don't hear of warfare clan to clan. We know of mass vocalization like grizzly bears when they come together in mating season. I've seen three, four grizzly bears sitting there with a female and ready to get in heat. And they're all pawing away and acting all, I'm tougher than you. And pretty soon two of the bears will leave because they're smaller and they got out intimidated. They're just like, I don't want to go fight that big boy. I can get my ass whooped. (laughs) Well, the other big boy, he's like, I'm going to try him. Next thing you know, he goes in, there's a big grizzly bear fight. I'm in awe watching it. And the uh, weaker one gets his ass whooped and uh, the big boy gets to mate the uh, female in heat. So that vocalizing posturing. Well, let's think about the Sasquatch YouTube video of a couple towing a pontoon boat behind their truck. And I think it's California or Oregon. And the transmission goes out. So they're sitting in the pontoon boat, must be warm, it's nighttime, and they have a video camera that has low light capabilities, and they have two dogs, and you can hear all of the Sasquatch vocalization. What that was was probably a rendezvous. Clans and families of Sasquatches came together, and just like commercial fishermen, when they show up in a bar, be it Alaska or some other port, what do we do? Hey, Bob, how you doing? Someone stands up. Beep you, Tommy. I remember when you did this. I'm not here to fight. I'm here to shoot pool and drink beer. Come on, keep quiet. Water under the bridge. That vocalizing posture. That's what those Sasquatches were doing because they, number one, they can't go fighting each other because injury is caused. Infection sets in. Next thing you know, it weakens their tribe and kills the individual. So like grizzly bears, instead of just four of them coming out and fighting over that female, they'll vocalize and posture to see who's tougher and stronger and louder. And that's what those Sasquatchers are doing on that one. And then there's probably a half a dozen others I can remember listening to of mass grouping of Sasquatches vocalizing, seeing who's the tougher clan, who's louder, who's looks stronger. Then they sit down to do their get together. Why ever? We don't know. But just like the Indians in North America, we had to have potlatch and powwow, and we still do. The newcomers to North America, Sasquatch Island, the bushmen, prospectors, fur trappers, explorers, they had rendezvous. And they still have rendezvous where everyone shows up. And what happens in the tents and longhouses, big houses, teepees, tule huts, and the list goes on when that mass tribe gathering takes place everyone's young people out there bumping uglies man getting it on because that's nature's code you got to strengthen the species by spreading the seed and bringing others from non-family non-close genetic ties so that's where sasquatch rendezvous happen just like other rendezvous powwows potlatches rodeos you know I've been to a rodeo. I've seen people, cowboys, bumping ugly in a pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any type of like discernible differences between, uh, you know, Sasquatch Tribe A and Sasquatch Tribe B, um, or is it just kind of, you know, generally like everybody kind of has that same patty appearance, or did? Do any maybe take on any type of 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 garb or masking or like for instance you had you had mentioned that you kind of grew up with that that boogeyman uh, conversation with uh, your kids that you know it it would come in and have a sack or you know that it carried to take the kids so is there any any kind of uh, you know discernible differences. I can only speak for the Pacific Northwest where I've seen Sasquatches, which is British Columbia. And then I've seen one in uh, uh, Omaha Indian Reserve in Nebraska. So speaking on those ones, they all look alike, what I've seen. But I, you know, like any other investigator enthusiast, I've, you know, explore and still do the internet. And you see, you know, the skunk ape, the famous picture that someone took with a flash of a skunk ape, you know, biker beard. 
really had a like an orangutan look about it. Uh, the Naga or Nagani from the Northwest Territories. This one, I believe, was from northern Saskatchewan, Canada. It's when we started having flip phones back in the day and had video. So it's low quality, it's blurry, but that Sasquatch is really tall. Like it's like a nine or 10 footer, but the look of it is different than the Pacific Northwest Sasquatch I found. I heard a lot of stories when I was living up in the Northwest Territories in 2015, 2016 about Naga, their Sasquatch. It seems to be very big, nine, ten footers, very aggressive. Uh, I see I met a man who is native Indian up from up there, and uh, he lifted up his pant leg and showed me the scars from where a Naga had scraped his flesh, digging big gouges from their nails as because him and his two brothers were out muskox hunting in the winter and they spooked going through a crack and rocks, you know, because it's really rocky up there and, and spruce forest. But anyway, they were going through this open area where this crack was and it was really windy and they spooked a group of Naga all hunt, hunt, hunkered down and they chased the humans and as they were trying to go up this ro rocky outcropping he was in the tail end and that naga grabbed his leg and his two brothers and the other hunter were pulling him and that sasquatch naga tore his leg up so you know that was pretty neat but when i asked him what did it look like and so forth it really looked like the northern saskatchewan flip phone video of a sasquatch it didn't fit the picture of during the him telling me what it looked like didn't fit the Pacific Northwest profile of a Sasquatch. But then when I investigate and study the Sasquatches in my area, I find that based upon the sighting reports, the one-eyed one, the cinnamon colored clan, the black ones, the brown ones, it seems their clan territories correlate to my Kwakwaki walk tribal territories. The Kwakwakiwak Nation is made up of 16 recognized tribes. I belong to the Mamliacha, the Namgis, or the Mamliacha and the Kriyakos and I used to be a Namgis tribe member, but we're all Kwakwakiwak. But out of that, we know with geological prominent features like points or rivers or islands or mountains, we know where the geographical boundaries are. And then we back it up, our ancestors, with pictographs or petroglyphs, rock carvings and paintings. So we know where our tribal boundaries are. And in my territories, it seems like the Sasquatch clans correlate right, comparable to our tribal boundaries mainly because of prominent geological features, meaning they seem to be using this river for the salmon and the steelhead, and they seem to be swimming across to this island area for the winter shellfish. They seem to be seen in this area in March and April when the herring come in to spawn in the shallows, and I mean shallows, like that deep of water. It's a solid herring. You can bend down and pick up a five-gallon bucket in half 20 minutes, so a Sasquatch can fill their belly with 20, 30 pounds of herring, no problem whatsoever during the herring spawn. And then you have the summertime where when there's snows recede in early June, the Sasquatches in Pacific Northwest follow the receding snow. What they're looking for is ravens and uh, whiskey jacks and turkey vultures that have just flown up from Oregon and California migrated to Vancouver Island, coastal British Columbia, and golden eagles from the States and our bald eagles because they're looking for carrion. The snow recedes, exposes an ungulate, a hoofed animal that didn't get off the high mountain and got covered in snow, hypothermic, died. Now the snow melts and exposes the carrion. The birds go down for it because they see it right away and smell it. Sasquatches see that go in there and there's some nice food to eat, some fresh meat. Well, not fresh meat, but carrion. And a lot of people would think, ooh, carrion. Well, look at the, the what do you call it? Australians they, and British. They eat rotten vegetable matter called marmite and something else in the little jar. And then we have the Europeans that will hang ducks and pheasants by the neck before plucking or cleaning them. And when the thing tenderizes that the head separates then the bird falls onto the floor of the barn or the basement, then they pluck it and clean it and eat it. It's a delicacy to this day to some people in Europe. And then we have my tribe that eats uh, oligan oil, 
derived from boiling a fish called ooligan or smelt that's been softened for about a week to eight days and then it's boiled and the oil drawn out that we render down it's indian ketchup to me it's you know it's really good eating but if you tried it you know you're either gonna love it or hate it there's no in between you know it's got a bite to it but i love the taste and the smell and then you have the Arctic where they eat stink flipper and they put birds into the stomach cavity of a harvested seal that's been cleaned out and they sew it back up and bury it in the soil. And then when it softens up and ferments, then they eat it. So every human species, even Lewis and Clark document about the one Indian tribe, when the spring thaw came, the buffalo jump where the bloated carcasses of these buffalo were exposed. This Indian tribe, they were running down to the river with their spoons and knives, eating all of that, what we would call rotten meat, but to them was a delicacy. So in my studies, and I'm the only Sasquatch investigator to date that's put the two and twos together and done the investigating to know that in my area, those receding snows expose carrion which we would call carrion, but the Sasquatches seem to be homing in on it. And plus, you got to remember, there are no berries yet. The grasses are just starting to grow. But once you're up in the alpine, and in a few, a week, the grasses are there to eat, the flowers. Soon you got the roots plumping up because of the sun. And you have all of the ungulates coming into the alpine, the fawn drop, because they want to take advantage of that lush grass. And they don't want to be like Sasquatch and animals don't want to be like stupid humans living in the forest because in June, July and early August, the forest fires sweep through the forest. Sasquatches and ungulates are out of the forest fires up in the alpines. So that's where the Sasquatches are too, capitalizing on fawn drop. So you've, now I'm seeing your guys' body ticks and I'm reading it. You guys are sitting there going, holy schmuck, that Indian knows a lot of stuff about Sasquatches. <laughs> yes, I lived like one for decades. <laughs> Yeah, and you touched on uh, yet another thing that I was going to ask, man. We're, like, we're really synchronized tonight because um, I, I I, had been curious if there was maybe some type of migratory pattern or something that they might adhere to, like uh, following uh, salmon when they, you know, it, like, like, like a grizzly would then go, you know, follow the trails of a salmon in the springtime or uh, whatever. Whenever that that occurs, I'm not quite a uh, an outdoors expert, but yeah, you just answered again one of my next questions, just right right out of the gate there. So that was actually super. Well, yeah, interesting. you can remember like in our Vancouver Island region in Washington State, in you know mid to late August, Sasquatches are up in the Alpines. They're getting sick of eating berries and deer. I know I hate eating deer. I can't stand eating deer. But anyway, you know, all of a sudden they look down from the elevated world that they're living in and they see the white backs of seagulls going into the streams and rivers they see the flash of sunlight off the backs of bald eagles that are eating the salmon in the rivers and the sasquatch goes okay let's go down the mountain salmon's returned and they go feast in the salmon grounds while they're there our gardens and our orchards come into you know a abundance in August and September into October. So they have a diverse diet. There's a cornfield with a salmon stream going through it. Well, they're just like us. They're eating corn on the cob and salmon during the summertime. Fall comes, they're harvesting the apples in our backyards and orchards, the wineries. You know, we got wineries all over the Pacific Northwest now. Uh, Eastern Washington State, and I can't say it right. I'm sorry if I destroy the name Wenatchee or Wenatchee, however they say it. It's the apple capital of the world, apparently. I drove through there, but man, is there ever a lot of apple trees? And then there's cherry trees, and then there's vineyards. And I'm sitting there looking at the mountains. We went to a place, a friend of mine, to investigate. And I'm like, oh man, the Sasquatches must just love being here. The creeks and streams and lakes are filled with trout and freshwater shellfish. There's all these orchards and wineries and cattle farms and deer and turkeys and the list goes on. So each area, there is a seasonal migration of the Sasquatch clan or individual, which opens up the door now. Individual, missing 411, David Pilates, you know, thousands of people going missing in the bush and parks and everything. You know, what is it? Fear the rogue. You come across a rogue Sasquatch, get the hell out of there. So 
when we look at our species as a human and we hear about someone going postal, grabbing a rifle and doing the god awful, uh, just awful what happens with some people snapping in their head. And when you look into it, it's usually a male who was told to get the beep out of the house by the woman. You're never going to see your children again. You're going to have to spend thousands in court fees and legal fees. And you may get some visitation rights if I allow you. And I'm going to take you for everything. And yada, yada, yada. list goes on. Next thing a human goes postal, bang, 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 kills a bunch, puts it in his mouth, pulls the trigger in most cases. Well, a Sasquatch, as I told the, everyone early about, everything has to bump uglies and strengthen the species. That's just the code. So... You're a big Sasquatch clan leader, bumping uglies when you want to bump uglies. The other males that you allow in your family unit, your clan, they're not allowed to bump uglies because it's not good for the clan to proliferate like the hairless humans we are that will fornicate just for the heck of it. Every other species generally only fornicates to produce offspring, and it's usually the head male and female that are allowed to do that, strengthening the genetic species code so when a sasquatch gets challenged by a younger one and gets toppled i think you know i've seen it happen with wolves where the head wolf gets ousted as the leader he has a choice to stay at the fringes of the pack he's no longer part of the social structure he's way down now in the in the basement and beyond he's lower than a slave so when he does go to the kill of the pack if they allow him, he just gets the scraps. Even the puppies get food before he does. And if he gets too close to the pack, he gets chased and bit in the butt and beat upon. So he can stick around with the pack and be a beggar, peasant, or he can break away and go solo. And I've seen so many solo wolves that sometimes will team up with a grizzly bear. And I have pictures of grizzly bear tracks, big grizzly bears with abscessed teeth, arthritis, cataract, and yet they're hanging out with a displaced head wolf of a pack. And that famous Finland photographer, it's all over the internet, the pictures he has of a Finnish grizzly bear with a wolf. They work together. But there's some of those ones, Sasquatches, that when they do get ousted, I think they go postal. Something snaps upstairs. And they get bigger, they get more aggressive. And I think those are the ones that add to David Pallides' books collection of missing 411 humans. So when you come across a very aggressive Sasquatch, don't be a stupid human. You're going to end up getting pooped out by a rogue Sasquatch because everything in the bush adheres to the bush code and anything that goes into the bush will eventually be pooped out by multiple critters it's the code why do it 20 years too early so if you're near an aggressive sasquatch get out of there you might get bingoed and pooped out over the next couple of days well i just want to be the first one to say that being pooped out by a sasquatch is on my list of things to do before i die so <laughs> not me you go right ahead <laughs> I don't want to be a Sasquatch <laughs> demon coil on the side of our trail. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a really interesting take that I had not heard before. Yeah, um, it seems like you're just that much. You're that far ahead of everybody else as far as all of this this goes. Um, because I lived out there. You know, I've forgotten more about Bush than most humans that live in the urban environment will ever know. And, you know, there was, at times, I would go weeks in the bush. My gun, by pack under 20 pounds with coffee and uh, tobacco, a cotton bedroll, and a plastic tarp, my Mustang floater coat, my Helly Hansen, uh, like ski pants, but they're rain gear, my rubber boots in my pack, my running shoes, my three knives on my side, uh, my three or four Bic lighters. You know, I always watch these people. I'm a survival specialist. I'm going to bow drill. I'm going to use this fire starter. I'm going to use this fire coil, fire tube. I'm going to click rocks together. I'm like, hey, dumb people. He's a Bic lighter, man. Bic lighter lasts you three months in a bush. One of them. Bring three, you're good for a year. You know, I'm a smoker. I use a Bic lighter 15, 20 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I, 
so many people are coming at this from that want to look cool on TV kind of kind of uh, aspect. And even at least on this side, you know, the boots on the ground people are still not, you know, as knowledgeable and still don't go out and live in the bush like like you've spent like most of your life doing. So the, I think, man, just the even in the 50 minutes that you've been chatting with us, I am so much more prepared if I ever come across something like that. And I'm so much more prepared for when Sasquatchers goes out and, and does our thing on uh, June 1st. And I didn't even consider that there might be a rogue Sasquatch. If I'm going to be completely honest from where I'm sitting, I often even wondered if there was any violence at all from the Sasquatch to humans because at least documented accounts seem to be like if like people are living to tell the tale. So I had not even considered yeah. about, you know, missing 411 or anything like that. And then, you know, the people we get different answers and... from everybody too about it. Right. And that's, that's one of the coolest things about this interview with you is most of the time we have like this weird synchronicity on this show where, you know, even without bringing it up, a guest will almost accidentally make a reference to something that was said before. And you have it like this is like the first time that we've had an interview where everything is just so dynamically unique. And that to me, I think adds a lot of credence to what you're saying. And man, yeah, I'm just flabbergasted by the knowledge like that say, you're passing down. Yeah. Like I say to the listeners, I'm speaking to now of this, your guys is, uh, Sasquatch's Paranormal Podcast. You know, the listeners are the ones that need to reach out to you. If they want to see me come back on again, they got to tell you. But, you know, I got so many things to teach everyone about how to get close to Sasquatches, you know, also my encounters. We haven't talked about my many encounters, you know, like people are going, have you seen Sasquatch? Oh, yeah, I've seen them over half a dozen times, been close to them over 30 times. Huh? Well, yeah, I lived in the bush, man. While you were sitting there turning light switches on and running water and flushing toilets, I was out there using leaves for the toilet. And freaking, I'd go to bed when it got dark because I didn't want to turn my flashlight on. Because, you know, when you see these supposed specialist extremers and they're sitting there with their flashlight or their video camera, like the uh, Lone series and, and uh, Naked and Afraid, it's like the sun's going down. Go to sleep. Because then if you do get woken up and you're awake, you got woken up by for a reason. So that's when you better have a good charged flashlight or a video camera to record. And when the birds make noises, sun's coming up, it's time to wake up. So when we used to go to bush, you know, we'd bring a spare set of batteries, but a flashlight would last us a month. We might need turned it on maybe half a dozen times. And it was usually because I dropped my lighter when I was trying to have a cigarette when I couldn't go to sleep. So... You know, the bush, you got to really work with the bush. You got to work and use all of the bush knowledge that's out there. And, you know, this environmental and extreme survivalists and that, that's not the way. And the best way, like I said, for being a Sasquatch investigator is go to Sasquatch Island, join it, read it. The other way is come out and take an expedition with me, be it Washington State or Vancouver Island. I do expeditions year round. People go, oh, when's the dates? My schedule is your schedule. Your budget dictates how we're going to go investigate. It might be as easy as showing up here in Kent, Washington, and I walk out with my equipment and I charge you 200, I think it's 25 a day or 250. And I go out for 24 hours with you, day and night. And, you know, if you want me for eight hours, you know, we can cut a deal. But anyway, I'll take you out and teach you things. Or you all of a sudden, you know, be a smart human. If you got to fly from Pennsylvania, New York to Kent SeaTac Airport in Kent, in Washington State and get a hotel, uh, rent a vehicle because I don't have one. And we go investigating for three days. You know, I charge, say, 250 a day. That's 750 right there. And then your hotel at 300 bucks a day. That's another 900 bucks plus food. That's over another 12 to $1,500. Be smarter, charter an Indian Sasquatch guide. Buy me a ticket, 
Wife drops me off at SeaTac. I fly to wherever you are. Boots on the ground in your backyard and your turf. And however long you want me there, you got to fly me back. Don't make me hitchhike. But anyway, I will <laughs> teach you. And we will probably more than likely find evidence, if not hear, smell, or hopefully have the close encounter of the hairy kind of the Sasquatch. Because they've got a sloping forehead. They're easy to find. You just got to know how to do the tricks. That's why I laugh at all these TV shows, tree knocking, and got their little Sasquatch good luck charm hanging off their camo backpack. Number one, don't ever wear camo if you want to see a Sasquatch. I do. Sasquatch Island, we got our, you know, our logos and everything, and SasquatchLegend.com patches on our camo shirts and vests and jackets, but it's to look cool. I'm a human. I want to look cool when I go to those conferences, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have pissed up, higher up the fence post than those other researchers, because number one, if someone says they're a Sasquatch researcher, they're so full of caca, their eyes should be brown because they're BSing you. There is no Sasquatch researcher until someone comes out with a Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall interaction with a Sasquatch or a Sasquatch clan family unit. So there is no Sasquatch researchers, and anyone who calls himself is suffering from small penis syndrome and trying to act like you're really big. <laughs> They're not going to piss up high as the fence posts as I can, because I've lived it like a Sasquatch. And that's what I'm here to do, is to teach people. And that's why I do the podcast, to get the word out. You know, how come no one's coming to Washington State or Vancouver Island? We do book trips. And, you know, I'll be in Forks, Washington from December 21st to the 29th. You know, someone's like me, bah humbug, doesn't want to sit around and do the BS family stuff with Christmas. Go Come to Kent, take an expedition with me. And, you know, or even just come hang out with me and sit in the store while I'm doing my painting of my different things. Like I do things like this. I, I got a thousand wood bowls and I put West Coast Sasquatch on. There's my native footprints. But I'll be in Kent, Washington. And then SasquatchLegend.com with half a dozen bulls. I'll be painting away all day long. Someone will come in, buy a T-shirt, might get me to autograph something, or just sit there at the picnic table on painting and chatter, chatter like two Sasquatches. Have fun. And they got a coffee shop and donuts and everything. So come on to Forks, Washington. Come out here and let's go investigating. You know what? I might have to do that. I might have to go ahead and tell the wife not to expect me at Christmas because <laughs> don't even tell. Don't even tell. Just go. <laughs> yeah, just go. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm yeah, joking. You know, when she you're hears that, she'll be mad at me. Rogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're gonna end um, up as Sasquatch uh, poop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, so obviously you have you had uh given the link to your website and you have the facebook group uh sasquatch island are there any other links that you want to share or anything that you want to promote here in the last minute of the of the show well, the youtube channel sasquatch island it's um i was out commercial fishing for a lifetime but in the last few years before i retired i was you know videotaping places in the british columbia coast where sasquatch has been seen some unique terrain i got some other posts on there and uh definitely you know email me you know names on the board there thomas seawood but tom seawood tom.seawood at gmail.com or go to my website sasquatchisland.com the link through the email send me an email if you got questions i'm happy to answer them uh no offense, but white man's magic, Facebook Messenger, the modern day smoke signal. You know, <laughs> Thomas Seawood is my Facebook handle. Um, a lot of people will join uh, Sasquatch. I don't join Thomas Seawood because I'm just about maxed out. But send me an email. This is my Facebook profile or my Messenger handle or whatever. You know, you got Zoom, you got all kinds of ways we can video talk and you know i can you know i'm even thinking of starting to do uh uh maybe 25 dollars an hour and you can video link with me i'll do the link and i'll just basically do what we did on this podcast I'll, but i'll go more in depth teach you the bush chess how to that better your chances to have that close encounter of the hairy kind like there's a lot of tricks like this windage always test your wind the other one when you smell something Stick it in your nose. Get those hair, hairs wet. Now you can really smell. That's why wolves and bears and other animals lick their nostrils to get those nose hairs wet so you can smell something better. And then when you smell it again, don't look those ones again. They're on your nose. Lick the other hand. That's a bush trick. 
<laughs> Wise words. <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank you for your time. This has been an incredible uh, show. I Sitting here listening to you talk, it, it's not only an honor, but it's been a privilege because you're knowledgeable and entertaining as hell. And I cannot express enough gratitude for having you come on. I want everybody to check those links out, check his art out, check the YouTubes, do everything that you can to uh, support everything that he does because, you know, there isn't anybody who's more boots on the ground when it comes to this kind of, of research. And so again, thank you for your time. And this has been a fun episode, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hit the uh, outro. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and all that other fun stuff that, that podcasters, you know, always reiterate at the end. And we will see you two more times this week. This is a big one for us. We got a three for this week. And we could not have started it in a better way. Thank you very much. Squatch you later. Thanks for Thank squatching. You. Thanks for squatching.